that's okay with everybody. I think most people have entered the room. So <clears throat> welcome Lenny and, and the participants in the, the webinar today um, to the fourth uh, in the series of uh, webinars that we're doing for our Blue Skies Green Future. Uh, today we're going to have Lenny Kaur uh, from the Management School. I'll introduce her in more detail later. But we are the Transforming Foundation Industries Network Plus. Uh, it's, but we're based at the University of Sheffield, the University of Leeds, Swansea and Manchester. Um, and I just want to introduce a little bit about us and then go on to introduce Lenny. Um, these are the uh, protagonists with the uh, Transforming Found Industry, Transforming the Foundation Industries Network Plus. If I'm the PI, I bet I should learn how to say it properly, shouldn't I? Um, you can see myself here, Professor Ian Rainey, uh, you have my uh, uh, deputy, Susan Bernard Lopez from the University of Leeds, William and Cam from the Universities of Manchester and Swansea, respectively, and our industrial advisory panel uh, chair is Chris McDonald from the Materials Processing Institute. You've been liaising whilst you've been uh, booking um, and reserving your tickets for this particular event with Deborah Froggart, our marketing officer, and our network manager, if you have uh, any inquiries about who we are and what we do, is Neil Lowry and he and Debbie can pass on contact details for the Network Plus uh, if you need them. So what, what is our core aim? Well, we're here to, uh, to co-create, identify new science and technology to enable the transformation towards more sustainable, cost-efficient and products and practices within the foundation industries. The foundation industries are the heavy industries uh, that we have in the UK, um, ceramics, metals, glass, chemicals, paper, and cement. Uh, this is a designation uh, that has been created by the UKRI for the purposes of us to, to see projects and do research on the behalf of the foundation industries. We currently have uh, around 400 members in the uh, Network Plus, so you can join the Network Plus. We have websites and everything, and Debbie can give you all the information to do that. Uh, we fund projects. We funded uh, recently £270,000 worth of projects um, uh, about three months ago, and we're coming to a call uh, uh, deadline on the 1st of October for projects in circular economy and resource efficiency. Hence, we've got Lenny speaking in that general area. We have multiple facets to what we're trying to achieve. And you'll notice circular economy and resource efficiency on the left-hand side in the cartoon feature very heavily, as does EDI, next generation processes, policy and advocacy, and manufacturing informatics, all major topics within our uh, network. And we're here to encourage those things uh, within the foundation industries. Okay, so I'm going to uh, introduce Lenny now. Um, Lenny and I have worked together for uh, a number of years. Uh, I'll not say how many. Um, and we've had a very active uh, collaboration, uh, looking at different aspects of mainly life cycle assessment. Uh, but more recently, I think we've been talking uh, more generally about supply chains and circular economy. Lenny is the uh, has appeared is is the uh, chair uh, in operations management, uh, founders and directors of the logistics and supply chain management research center. That's a long title, Lenny. Uh, at the management school uh, and um, faculty of faculty center of energy and environmental sustainability, all at the University of Sheffield. Um, she uh, leads several consortia and networks uh, around the world. I think the biggest is the Advanced Resource Efficiency Center, AREC, if, I'm, if I understand correctly. She has a colossal H factor, huge, uh, and is one of the most cited people in the field, certainly in the UK, if not the world. Um, she is one of the most active people in getting things done that I've ever met in my life. And she has a reputation of being dedicated, very uh, 
um, focused and very effective at making things happen at a strategic level. And uh, I've always respected very much that part of their personality and drive. She's going to speak today on supply chain sustainability and, and decision-making science. And I think I've said enough and embarrassed her enough. So I'm going to hand over to Lenny and stop sharing my screen. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Well, thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ian, for your very generous uh, introduction. And thank you for inviting me uh, to uh, speak uh, at this uh, event uh, for uh, the Network Plus uh, on transforming the foundation uh, industry led by uh, yourself, uh, Ian, uh, in collaboration with Partners University. Um, so the title of my talk today is uh, regarding supply chain resource um, efficiency, uh, resource sustainability, um, and decision science. So uh, my background uh, is uh, rooted in management and supply chain, especially uh, based at the management school at the Faculty of Social Science. So uh, some of my publication and research have been rooted in that domain and in that discipline. And uh, with the intellectual underpinning uh, of the specific theory uh, from that field, and uh, I have been developing a model and framework to uh, create uh, an environment whereby supply chain can be more resource sustainable sustainable and efficient uh, going forward. Uh, in the past, the ways of doing business is uh, organization compete with another organization uh, based on cost base and competitiveness. Uh, but going forward, especially when we are under the backdrop of sustainability, addressing climate change, facing stiff competition uh, in getting uh, limited resources uh, supply, such as uh, critical raw materials and so on, we are talking about an environment whereby supply chain uh, will compete with each other, but from the perspective of a resource sustainable supply chain. So from that concept, uh, we publish a paper uh, in International Journal of Operations and Production Management, looking at uh, ways in which uh, how these resource sustainable supply chains can be created. So in this particular um, uh, framework, uh, we look at optimizing um, the, and overcoming the temporal scarcity of resources. We look at quantifying the environmental and economic and social capital of resources. We look at efficient mapping of interconnectedness between supply chain resources capital. We look at developing supply chain resource sustainability as a competitive strategy. And then we look at collaborative uh, supply chain resource sustainability for predictive decision making. And then this loop go back and go round and round again, so which is a, a circular loop. So the idea of this concept really is about treating resources as something that will be scarce, but it will have a time-based uh, factor that affects the scarcity of resources. And in fact, uh, we can take a specific example, which is very current at the moment, uh, looking at scarcity of potential uh, resources such as labor, like driver uh, in the logistics sector, uh, affecting the food supply chain in the retail market, and also the, spark, uh, the spike of gas prices, which is affecting uh, uh, availability uh, or potential risk of availability of energy supply going forward in the business to business environment. So I think these are very two, uh, you know, very timely examples that are happening right now uh, in terms of how important a resource sustainable supply chain is going to be uh, in everything that we do in our business environment and it, uh, in uh, uh, cross sectors environment. And with this thinking and with this basis, then we link this to how can we then use this understanding to inform decision making? And how can we use the data to create the data into something that is uh, 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 intelligent and uh, make prediction uh, to allow a better use of resources going forward? So linking to the availability and resiliency of resources, uh, we are talking about resources such as materials, time, uh, money, data or intelligence, labor, talent, energy, machines, technology, and ecosystems. So these are uh, generic terminology, but they apply across different sectors, especially uh, within the context uh, of the talk today. Uh, they are very important, especially for the foundation industry uh, across the six sectors that we are talking about. 
So the theoretical underpinning from the management field about this concept is rooted from integrated resource efficiency view theory. Uh, so again, this has been published as well in International Journal of Operations and Production Management, looking at um, advancing a novel theoretical approach, which is IREV, that uh, is underpinned by natural resource-based view and systems theory. So uh, basically the idea uh, is uh, to avoid looking uh, this like a top-down approach, such as the ecological modernization theory, the main thrust of the IREV really is about nations evolving and adapting to the resource challenges and uncertainties in their production supply chain. And the second promise uh, in this theory, IREV, is the environmental, social, and economic capital of resource practices that are uh, macro level and reflecting this against the aggregate resource efficiencies of subsystems or production supply chain within industrial ecosystems. So we are talking about system within a systems. And the approach actually makes an important advances uh, over previous approaches by taking a systems view of resource efficiency to evaluate how and if efficient and sustainable resource practices can diffuse through production supply chain into host production economics. So linking the operational level, micro level changes uh, to a macro level and nations uh, level objectives. The IREV also helped to overcome the challenge of firms wanting to appear sustainable in, res in response to national or regional institutional pressures while contributing marginally to overall macro level sustainability as a result of boundary spanning, suppliers and outsourcing of production activities. And adopting IREV and index uh, would enable the alignment of corporate greening strategies at supply chain level with macro level sustainability targets. So the idea of IREV and the accompanying index really is to help to connect this um, operational level and macro uh, level assessment of sustainability uh, together in order to ensure that we achieve the target sets. Uh, the proposed IREV approach to resource efficiency offers uh, fosters improvements uh, in the measurement and management of macro level sustainability with academic manager, uh, managerial and policy uh, implications. So there's great impact uh, that come out from this theory. So this is just a screenshot to show how uh, the computation looks like in terms of uh, that concept and theory and the index uh, that we developed that compute uh, the uh, ranking of nations. And uh, we compute this across, uh, I think, 28 OECD uh, country. So this is the result. And again, this is available in the public domain in our paper. They look at a social resource efficiency uh, index against the environmental resource efficiency index, index which gives the overall uh, integrated resource efficiencies view uh, index. Uh, without going into too much detail about specific uh, performance by this index per country. And obviously the data shows that there are discrepancies in terms of uh, where they are being located and where improvement can be made. Uh, as um, Ian mentioned just now, um, in addition to my various roles within the university, I'm also uh, heading the Advanced Resource Efficiency Center with Sheffield University. And we have base uh, and hub across uh, the globe. And as an example, we have set up global partnerships with our US partner, which includes our Penn State's collaborator, specifically the Material Research Institute, uh, and also our national uh, laboratory uh, there uh, in the US, supported by DOE, uh, especially ARPA-E program. So in the wider context, why are we here? Why this is so important? It is because we are potentially facing scarcity of resources and supply chain resource sustainability is really important. It's a pathway to help addressing this problem, especially under the backdrop of requirement to address climate change uh, and the requirement to achieve net zero by 2050. And this year, the UK is uh, hosting uh, the COP26 uh, meeting and conference in Scotland. And uh, it is very important, and not just into the UK, but globally in terms of achieving this sort of targets. Uh, in the UK, for example, we have set a legally binding uh, agreement to achieve net zero by 2050, but various countries have different targets. In the US, we are in a very similar path, but in China, uh, they set up uh, uh, a specific target to achieve uh, carbon neutrality and net zero by 2060. And, and in Europe, uh, this is called Europe climate neutrality target, and this is uh, to be done by 2050. 
uh, there is a slight discrepancy between the definition uh, of net zero climate neutrality and carbon neutrality. So basically net zero refers to the balance between the amount of greenhouse gas produced and the amount removed from the atmosphere. So we reach net zero when the amount we add is no more than the amount taken away. Climate neutrality on the other hand refers to an economy with net zero greenhouse gas emissions, but carbon neutrality refers only to CO2. So achieving CO2 a net zero carbon neutrality uh, by 2050 or 2060. So this is a slight difference. So how can we achieve this target? So there are various ways and scale that this uh, can be considered. Uh, for example, this can be done through regeneration of cities, especially looking at the perspective of nexus of resources, particularly water, food, energy, and understanding the role of circular economy at scale. Uh, and how can we do this specifically for industry? We can decarbonize the industry and their supply chain. So looking at tier one, tier two, and tier end of the supply chain, not just a particular organization. We look at products, we look at materials and energy technologies in that overall systems. And then how circular economy and potentially LCA, life cycle analysis can play an important role, but at C2 level and also at scale uh, level. And last but not least, nature-based solution can also play a significant contributions to this uh, pathway by drawing down significant, uh, significant CO2 uh, from the atmosphere, for example, through um, uh, CCS technology, uh, back technology and DAX. Uh, and LCA and scale can also play a significant role in this particular pathway going forward. Uh, I provided some examples here and demonstrators. So uh, this uh, is available. Uh, the share will be uh, the slides will be shared uh, amongst everybody, so we can then uh, have a look at the video uh, at our le leisure afterwards. Uh, my group uh, has developed a specific software uh, that we normally use uh, to assess and compute uh, environmental impact of supply chain, and this software is called Senet. Supply chain environmental analysis tool. So we have been doing this uh, work for several, for many years, and it, vo it evolves from the original edition of Senate to Senate Plus, Senati, and the current edition uh, is called Senate 4.0. So the current edition, Senate 4.0, is the most advanced edition. Uh, it is a cloud-based uh, suite, and our uh, technology partner is Microsoft. So it is based on uh, Microsoft Azure uh, cloud capabilities platform, and uh, Senate 4.0 specifically integrates the technology of AI and machine learning, artificial intelligence and machine learning in order to predict sustainable resources and understand their future impact on economic, um, environment and social, especially on the planet and society. So uh, not only we can do that uh, by using primary data, which is very useful, but uh, we can also use large scale big data from secondary sources, uh, such as the World Bank, uh, Google Earth Engines uh, map, uh, NASA database, uh, file database, and so on, in order to make this uh, research and prediction. Uh, these are some of the funded examples that I've been engaged with, uh, including SUPS, for instance, which I've been working very closely with Ian about materials uh, sustainability, and a few others here that are shown on the slide. And the whole idea really is uh, all of these have complementary uh, objective. And the idea is to achieve sustainability, uh, achieve net zero, trying to address the issue and the challenges that has been outlined just now. So now I'm going to deep dive a little bit into a, uh, some uh, cases. And these are real cases underpinned by uh, research uh, and published. Uh, some of them are published and most of them in fact are published, uh, looking at uh, how uh, uh, the role and the idea of supply chain resource sustainability uh, concepts uh, has been applied uh, through various methods and scale uh, across different cases. So let's start with case number one, um, circular supply chain and economy, but particularly looking at electronic waste. So this work uh, has been uh, published uh, in a couple of uh, uh, journals here, so including uh, the work that we have done uh, by uh, looking at ways in which we can transition from a linear economy or a linear supply chain to a circular economy or to a circular supply chain. So this work is published in Omega and it's a management journal is, and this is also highly cited. In fact, this paper is the underpin uh, of a lot of the work uh, that we uh, do uh, in the domain of circular economy, especially from the management uh, domain. 
And the one in the middle uh, in renewable uh, and sustainable energy reviews uh, look at specifically electronic waste. Um, and uh, this really look at the economic assessment and making prediction of present and future e-waste stream. Again, uh, this paper is also highly cited and it received uh, an award uh, from uh, Elsevier. So the idea of this really is to look at, you know, multiple types of waste stream that can be recovered and recycled uh, in order to address the problem and the challenges that outlined previously. And last but not least, uh, looking at the linearity and the circular supply chain, uh, we look at uh, a specific industry in that work, uh, so, uh, looking at the case study uh, from construction uh, industry. So cement, steel, et cetera, are highly relevant within that particular industry. Again, these are all available in the public domain. Uh, at the moment, I'm guest editing a special issue uh, for International Journal of Production Research, looking at uh, uh, achieving carbon neutrality via supply chain management. Deadline for submission is by the end of December 2021. So this is basically informed uh, under the backdrop of why uh, carbon neutrality and net zero is really important and how uh, the role of supply chain can play and contribute uh, to this particular direction going forward. And previously, we have done work uh, in the area of circular economy, production system, and published special issue that look at the trends uh, and challenges uh, for operations management, and this uh, was uh, in uh, IJPR as well. And uh, in 2019, we have also looked at uh, how uh, Industry 4.0 technology, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, is going to be uh, important and play a disruptive role uh, in the area of operations and supply chain. And uh, this work, uh, we, we have published a position paper uh, in this uh, work. Uh, and again, you know, uh, when we are going uh, forward and moving forward, it is not just about natural resources that will be uh, under threat. Uh, and uh, being uh, uh, one of the challenges, but also the challenges uh, from the digital angle uh, is going to be something that we need to uh, consider uh, embedded in our thinking and our model going forward. This is an example of the work that we published in Nature Electronic, looking at circular economy and electronic waste. So uh, basically e-waste generated by country in 2019, the map show on the left-hand side, there are so much of this e-waste. And there are 53.6 million tons of e-waste generated globally in 2019 alone. And what is interesting is out of this, only 17.4% uh, uh, of this are collected and properly recycled. So there is a huge gap or, or there is a huge opportunity whereby improvements and research should be made in order to address uh, one of the biggest waste problem, which is the e-waste uh, problem. Uh, the e-waste problems also links to the location whereby e-waste are being sourced uh, and processed and recycled. And sometimes a lot of these are happening uh, in the developing uh, or less developed economy whereby regulations are lax, uh, thereby uh, the risk of exposure to environmental damage uh, and health damage are much higher as compared to uh, where we are based, for instance, in, in Europe and in the UK. Um, so uh, the, uh, some of the key highlights from this paper that we published in Nature Electronics really look at uh, proposed uh, integration uh, between policy development and economic incentive specifically to address uh, this uh, challenge. Again, this work is available in the public domain and please uh, have a look uh, at this exciting uh, work. Uh, another example that we do together with our partners in Eric US is really looking at how can we turn waste uh, to useful resources. And specific case that we are looking at uh, in this particular project is about bottom ash recycling. So looking at how can we uh, create uh, useful uh, new material, uh, whether these are through uh, concrete aggregates, loose grade aggregates, ceramics or raw material cement uh, from recycling activities uh, from municipal uh, waste. Case number two is about economy structure. So this is at the macro level. So I talk about the multi-scale uh, uh, case study. So this one is at the higher macro scale, looking at environment and toxicology. So one example of this work that has been published in Nature Scientific Reports is looking at secondary data, trying to analyze and understand the drivers of US toxicological footprint trajectory between the year 1998 to 2013. So the gist of uh, the, this paper really is uh, the entire economic and the toxicology footprints is affected by the economic 
growth and demise uh, during the specific cycle and time. So, and how uh, this economic structure influenced the output of toxicological footprint really has a direct relationship based on the data that we analyze. So uh, what we are planning to do now going forward is to look at how this may look like uh, in the future, say by 2050 going forward. Case number three is looking at construction and manufacturing in particular materials such as MLCC, uh, ceramic, especially cement, steel, glass, etc. So this actually linked to raw material supply. So as we know, uh, we are relying on a global supply chain when uh, we need to source critical raw material or precious materials uh, or minerals elsewhere in order to produce a particular, I don't know, semiconductor or chips uh, or components or products that we need uh, in any finished product. So this means we will need to rely on import or availability of critical raw material supply, um, such as cobalt, um, uh, lithium, uh, niobium, uh, and many others. And there are many uh, examples as shown uh, on this uh, critical raw materials uh, supply map uh, by the EU. So based on this thinking, uh, we have done some research and look at uh, the specific situation of multi-layer ceramic capacitors, MLCC, and compare the environmental sustainability uh, with tantalum electrolytic capacitor tag. So this work really is to highlight, you know, what is the environmental damage and where is the hotspots uh, in terms of these two particular material uh, from LCA uh, point of view. And uh, the high proportion of tantalum in text actually result in the overall greater environmental impact compared to MLCC. So this is one of the major highlights uh, of the result uh, from this work and uh, electrical energy consumption, so energy input during the fabrication uh, of MLCC is the operation that contribute to the major uh, environmental hotspots in that particular manufacturing process. So again, you know, building on the same basis, we also publish work uh, with our team looking at uh, how can we make assessment of environmental impact uh, more um, user-friendly. So uh, with that concept, uh, this work created a chemical element sustainability index, uh, which has been published uh, in resources conservation and recycling, uh, drawing on uh, data and calculation uh, from human development index uh, indicator, uh, national economic importance indicators, uh, recycling uh, rate uh, and GWP, global warming potential, and then map this calculation and index across the uh, critical elements uh, in the periodic table as shown uh, on, on this slide. Again, this is very exciting stuff that look at how can we make uh, uh, environmental uh, impact understanding uh, for specific fundamental chemical element more uh, easily understood uh, from sustainability perspective. Case number four looks at automotive and aerospace. And this one is a real case study. So we are looking at electric vehicle and composites material, particularly for Jaguar, uh, Land Rover and Boeing. So uh, this is based on a project funded by EPSERC looking uh, at cradle to grave life cycle prediction of automotive materials and systems in service, and particularly looking at the impact of aging uh, on performance. So Simulife LCA, so we use uh, the Senate tool, which uh, I mentioned earlier uh, in this particular project. So as part of this work, Jaguar Land Rover and us, we work very closely together. We develop hundreds of models uh, in Senate, uh, LCA model and hundreds of scenarios. And this slide show uh, examples of the maps uh, and the results or the output uh, from the work that we did based on specific components and specific uh, vehicles uh, from Jaguar Land Rover. Uh, as part of the same project, we also look at uh, how the environmental impact will look like if we change the design from aluminum design uh, to um, a CFRP design. So the composite uh, material uh, overall actually reduce uh, a lot of this impact, such as global warming potential, uh, acidification, fresh water, human toxicity, and so on, and including the cost as well. So this study really helps uh, Jaguar Land Rover to uh, think about uh, and make decision in terms of switching uh, from uh, aluminum-based design for that particular component to uh, CFRP design. 
the case about Boeing, uh, again, is published uh, in IJC LCA journal, International Journal of Life Cycle Analysis, uh, looking at the, uh, at the environmental impact assessment of aviation emission reduction through the implementation uh, of uh, composite material. And we did this for the uh, Dreamliner, Boeing 787. Uh, so this is a LCA work based on the Dreamliner. So what is interesting is uh, we look at uh, not just uh, the situation currently, but also make prediction to 2020 value and 2050 value and also model different scenario as can be uh, shown, uh, as can be seen here in table four uh, as a summary output from our analysis. Again, this uh, work is in the public domain without going uh, into too much detail. Uh, this, this is one of the uh, uh, very detailed uh, LCA work that we did because of the complexity uh, of the products uh, involved. Case number five is about energy and net zero. Uh, and this is uh, specifically referring to PV uh, perovskite uh, example, CCUS, hydrogen, and nuclear. So according to the net zero by 2050 IEA report, uh, there is uh, an indication that shows um, there are multiple uh, ways to achieve net zero. And this is uh, the pathway uh, that uh, has been suggested by the IEA report. So as you can see here, it will require uh, a combination over the years um, by the transitioning from um, uh, oil and gas free um, uh, sources uh, to a more sustainable and low carbon sources. And this includes uh, application in transport, uh, like in trucks, uh, in cars and vehicles, uh, to the direction of electrification, uh, as well as uh, to building application. If we look at the energy vector and technology for net zero, again, from the same report, it will require a combination of different uh, sources. And this includes CCUS, uh, technology performance uh, influence, electrification, other renewable sources such as PV uh, and wind, bioenergy, hydrogen, and a few others. Nuclear uh, also play a significant role uh, in order to achieve a net zero target. So this is a report by the Catapult, the Energy Catapult, looking at the expanded role of the new Hinkley Point C type generation three plus nuclear reactor for power generation. And uh, on this backdrop, uh, there is also more work that look at the development of uh, Gen 4 high temperature nuclear power plants, uh, coupled with hydrogen production technology, which is really important in order to reduce uh, the environmental impact and improve the availability. And then also switchability between power generation and the efficient of hydrogen to the supply industry will help uh, to provide the base load and um, security needed. Uh, there is also a lot of uh, discussion and development uh, that look at uh, and investigate how this can be applied in heavy road transport and marine uh, freight in addition to other applications. Uh, in addition to large scale uh, reactor type technology in this area, SMR uh, also play a, a role, uh, especially in city scale applications such as district heating networks to supply cost effective low carbon heat for urban homes and businesses. And from Sheffield, we are also doing some work uh, in this particular area, especially with AMRC, nuclear MRC, and partners such as Rolls Royce and Hinkley Point C. Another example that I would like to mention is the idea about the regional scale in the UK, especially in the north uh, of England, looking at how can we achieve net zero in the north of England more sustainably and effectively. So we are uh, uh, running a campaign and um, with this initiative, which is part of the Net Zero North campaign, looking at driving innovation for a net zero recovery from the COVID-19 to unlock new business opportunities and create jobs uh, in the green economy in the Northern powerhouse. So within the Net Zero North um, initiative, we focus on sustainable hydrogen economy, grow smarter uh, and skills and productivity. So all of these are really important. And this is part of the collaboration between the N8 universities together with uh, our partners and industry across the North, uh, including Northern Powerhouse, specifically targeting a uh, scale uh, of 300 million government investment to upskill uh, Northern workforces with uh, uh, thousands of uh, students years of net zero training, 
uh, it will have an impact to increase uh, the Northern Powerhouse um, GVA by 1.5 billion, creating jobs, securing jobs in the green sector, and also contribute 20% uh, of the reduction in CO2 in the North by 2030, uh, which is important and critical to put UK on track to achieve net zero by 2050. More information of this is available on uh, the website. And uh, another highlights I would like to mention is uh, uh, linking this to hydrogen uh, facilities. And I think recently uh, the government has just released the hydrogen strategy document and there are also uh, cons consultation at the moment, uh, looking at the role of hydrogen uh, as an important vector to achieve net zero by 2050. And the UK has uh, excellent uh, capabilities uh, on hydrogen research and innovation, including uh, in Sheffield, especially within the Energy Institute and the Translational Energy Research Centre. So uh, uh, last couple of days, uh, we just hosted the Accelerating Hydrogen event uh, here uh, in Sheffield uh, with speakers from across industries looking at uh, the role of blue and green hydrogens and a few other important things such as hydrogen, hydrogen value chains, uh, skills and many other things uh, to uh, help deliver the UK hydrogen strategy. And this is very important because it's, it's also fitting directly to the um, uh, Boris 10 point plan for a green industrial um, revolution. Another example, which uh, is about a micro scale, a specific uh, 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 technology that we look at uh, on renewable is perovskite. So this work has been published in a renewable and sustainable energy review, looking at the environmental impact uh, of uh, perovskite solar cells, uh, which look at um, the uh, environmental uh, performance by using hybrid uh, life cycle assessment. And in this work, we also did a significant or, or comprehensive review uh, comparing this technology with other uh, PV technologies. Uh, so the maps uh, in the middle here shows uh, different types of PV technology from silicon-based material uh, to other material. Uh, so if we look at the new one, the one that are emerging or novel, or more novel. So we, uh, on the right hand side, uh, we have a, a couple of options here, including perovskite, organic, uh, disensitized solar cells, uh, and quantum dot. Uh, so this work really uh, uh, highlight uh, the potential environmental sustainability performance of perovskite and its superiority. And what is interesting in this is uh, also the payback period that we calculated, which takes less than a year uh, for the payback period to be achieved if we switch to perovskite material. Uh, so this is very interesting and it's quite ambitious as well. So again, uh, if you are interested uh, in perovskite especially, uh, and then a fast uh, track way uh, to reduce payback or improve payback uh, response, uh, and this is uh, the way to do it. So this is uh, available in the public domain. Please feel free to take a look. Case number six uh, is uh, on a separate sector. Uh, this is in the fruit, uh, food sector, sorry, food sector, agri-food, especially a work that we published uh, on uh, the wheat to bread supply chain. So this work uh, is published in Nature Plants, looking at the um, environmental impact of fertilizer embodied in a wheat to bread supply chain. So uh, basically uh, the highlight or the key conclusions uh, from this work is, Wheat cultivation and the embodied fertilizers um, actually play a key role. And the LCA result shows um, ammonium nitride yields the biggest impact uh, in this supply chain. So 40% is actually caused uh, by ammonium nitride uh, in the fertilizer, fertilizer utilization uh, in growing wheat. Uh, so again, this paper is in the public domain. It's, it's interesting. It's also fundamental uh, thinking and work that uh, we have been using in a lot of the other uh, green or agri uh, food research that we are working on uh, at the moment. There are quite a few of them uh, that are live uh, at the moment. Case number seven uh, is about negative emissions uh, technology. And I would like to highlight the role of enhanced rock uh, weathering, which is one of the NETS uh, technology. So if we look at the left-hand side, uh, this is a report published by Royal Society and Royal Academy of Engineering, uh, looking at various uh, types of NETS. So uh, those that are ready for deployment, um, as you can see here, are forestation, soil carbon sequestration, habitat restoration, building with biomass, low carbon concrete. 
but those that are not yet demonstrated as scales, biochar, enhanced rock weathering. So we are working on how can we scale up the uh, use of enhanced rock weathering in this particular uh, juncture. And then also uh, in order to achieve this, uh, the report also suggested that uh, the role of BEX, uh, bio uh, carbon capture and storage, and also DEX, uh, direct air captures, CCS, uh, will play a significant role as part of this direction uh, going forward. So talking about uh, enhanced rock weathering, so the idea is really uh, to uh, use a rock, apply rock uh, on arable land, and then over the years, uh, the rock will absorb CO2 in a large scale from the atmosphere, uh, thereby significantly draw down CO2 from the atmosphere. It will also create uh, uh, co-benefits uh, when it uh, dissipates into ocean by reduced ocean acidification. So this work has been published in Nature uh, in our paper entitled Potential for Large Scale CO2 Removal via Enhanced Rock Weathering uh, with Croplands. So there are a lot of work going on at the moment in this space, looking at how uh, enhanced rock weathering can play a significant role in order to uh, address the 1.5 degree C challenge in the Paris Agreement, the IPCC report that has been published recently, uh, as well as COP26 in order to address global climate change. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Len. That was excellent, really informative. Um, so we're happy to take questions by the chat function, if that's okay. Um, we have a first question here. So based on the work you have completed so far, how impactful and realistic do you think SMR, techno SMR technology will be on UK decarbonisation, particularly for the energy-hungry FI? sectors and potentially to decarbonize clusters. Yes, I think small modular reactor uh, is going to play uh, an important role uh, in order to address the energy intensive industry, uh, especially with the foundation industry in the UK and elsewhere. Uh, there is already a significant drive uh, from industry on SMR. Uh, we are also world leading in the UK with high UK content on SMR technology and the scalability of SMR, which is smaller scale uh, as compared to other larger options, whereby it will be cheaper and more cost-effective and uh, less environmental damaging. Thereby the, um, the idea of it being rolled out uh, is a relatively uh, effective and efficient as compared to uh, those projects that will need a construction that will need a long time uh, to come to, to fruition uh, uh, due to um, standard uh, operating procedure. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's a comprehensive answer. Um, so I have a question that well, was from Cameron, the, uh, the question before. Uh, this is from Iwana. Hi, hi Lenny. What should, what should be, in your opinion, the first approach for SMEs to start decarbonization? Oof, that's a tough one. Uh, I'm going to leave that entirely with you, Lenny. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, SME, small and medium-sized organization, especially in the UK, majority of the businesses are classified as SMEs. And in fact, they do require a lot of support and assistance in order to help them to go through this decarbonization journey, especially now with the stringent or more stringent requirement for, from bigger player and from potential regulational uh, pressure uh, to report on their environmental footprint, uh, the way that they purchase the material, their energy sources, whether this is renewable or not, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are really crucial and they are under pressure to be able to do that uh, with limited uh, maybe access to finance or capability to be able to do that. So I think uh, there is a role that uh, academy Mix can play uh, like us to help them to do this uh, funding opportunities to help them uh, to access this capability, maybe through regional uh, engagement, regional growth hub, uh, etc. that we can play even within the foundation industry. For example, you know, for those supply chain or companies who are involved as part of those supplies into those in industry, we can provide our expertise to help them to do this. Now, in order to uh, uh, practically do this, first of all, I think they need to understand 
where exactly their carbon emissions are, where exactly the hotspots is, and so on. So they will need to map their supply chain, understand uh, uh, maybe through LCA as a method, uh, how, uh, uh, what are the key problems, and then what changes uh, can be made. So to make this tangible and um, measurable. Again, we have the expertise to do that. And we do work on that uh, sort of projects as well, but I think more can be done in this particular space. Totally agree with that. Find out where your major problems are and address those major problems. Uh, and then you can move forward. And the, my experience of working with Lenny is it's not always obvious where the carbon hotspots are or the environmental hotspots are. Um, they can be hidden. Uh, they can be in different parts of the manufacturing process. They can be, you know, in the mining and refining, as we discovered with um, some work we did on um, Niobium a few years ago. So I thought it was an excellent answer, and I absolutely uh, wholeheartedly agree. Um, so a uh, question here from Rob Ierson. Uh, first of all, have you done any work into glass manufacturing? And how do you think your models could help us address the challenges around increasing the volumes of glass that are recycled? At present, a lot of good glass is lost throughout the collection and processing stages across the recycling supply chain. And again, a very uh, deep question from Rob, so thanks very much. And um, I'll pass that over to Lenny, of course. Thank you. Uh, we just started a project on glass uh, at the moment, so uh, we don't have any results yet. Uh, but the model and the method that we use in other sectors are generic and they are applicable in glass or across different sectors. So we are now in that process of understanding the challenges in glass, getting the data, et cetera. So I'll be happy to pick this up uh, with uh, Rob and others. I know Rob is uh, active in this area. So we can you know, uh, share our knowledge uh, and uh, our discovery uh, in this particular direction. I That's think uh, just to comment on that, Rob, it might be an idea to try and get a meeting with Lenny to have a discussion about it and perhaps involve the TFI Network Plus as well um, to provide a bit of uh, uh, technical background if, if, if that's required. Um, you guys know a ton anyway, but um, there may be some new processes or something that we could uh, comment on. No, definitely. Uh, we're, I'd say just on that, we're, we're looking to try and arrange a, a more specific workshop to look at some of the challenges around recycling specifically for glass. So both trying to link up what's going on in the network plus as well as the, the TFI transfer project as well. So yes, um, Lenny will definitely reach out to you and involve you in that. That's great. Thanks very much, Barbara. So I think that's really good. The more people, you, more brains you put at the problem, the more likely you are to get a good solution. Um, so uh, there's a question here from uh, forgive me, uh, this is one of the problems with reading these out, but the name, I believe, is Debasish uh, Roy. Uh, thanks you, she thanks you, he or she thanks you. How could developing countries approach decarbonisation for end-to-end -end supply chain uh, and not only some parts of the supply chain? So I think it's the comprehensive approach that is being uh, asked about here. The question is about that rather than only supplying parts of uh, what is necessary for that particular industry. Yes, I think developing country also face a lot of challenges in terms of, you know, uh, addressing the sustainability of, uh, of, of the end-to-end uh, -end supply chain, uh, because developing country is also part of the global supply chain when they, you know, when we look at this from the perspective of exporting materials, elsewhere to other factories uh, and so on, or even just domestically uh, when things are manufactured. Uh, but uh, they are also facing a lot of challenges in terms of regulatory uh, understanding, um, also uh, accessing uh, to capacity and finance uh, and innovation needed. But there are a lot of uh, live examples at the moment that look at how uh, this can be uh, achieved. Uh, for example, there are work that are happening um, in, in China looking at you know, how, how supply chain can be more uh, made more uh, resilient from their perspective and also more sustainable uh, because of mining activities uh, is the same uh, in elsewhere or in other developing countries uh, as well. So I think it depends on the specific sectors and specific um, challenges. Uh, but we, from my research perspective, you know, we look at it from a system view. We look at it from the entire supply chain rather than just a particular operations. Uh, so I hope I uh, managed to answer some part of your question, but this is such a big question. <laughs> 
So um, I would like to ask a question. This is probably a very naughty one because I don't think we know really the answer. Um, we had a, a very good workshop on circular economy resource, resource efficiency on, on Tuesday, I believe, this week. And we had a speaker, Frank Dooms, and his comment, broadly speaking, was what kind of sustainable economy do we want uh, in the world? And maybe, you know, if you want to narrow it down within the wider European arena. And I guess it comes down to, to how we manage globalization versus localization. So, so you know, and, and I, I guess this government policy and all sorts is going to be involved in this. It's not a simple thing, but how do you perceive a sustainable world economy where there's requirements to, to do things locally, to minimize, uh, 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 maximize resource efficiency and minimize wastage? And um, you know, there's obviously a need to have resources moved around the planet. Is, is how do we inform governments from, from our level to, to, to get to the right point in terms of um, designing and trying to create and move towards an ideal economy for the future? Uh, it's a, probably a horrible question, but uh, do you have any thoughts <laughs> on that? So, so what, what bothers me most of all is what is a sustainable global or even European economy? Yes, I, I truly believe uh, in an economic system that is global, uh, which will uh, require collaboration uh, between different nations and stakeholders uh, for a global supply chain. Uh, that's first point. Uh, this uh, also have an impact in terms of how that how this will look like in terms of supply chain resiliency. How can we make the supply chain more resilient by reducing dependency on certain import, for instance? or improving resilience so that we can reduce the dependency uh, on certain import, on certain materials. So there is a um, chicken and egg situation, depends on the materials, depends on the relationship uh, of that supply chain at the highest level and on the trade uh, levels. And also a lot of things uh, outside our control, uncertainty in the marketplace, uh, fluctuations, uh, control, uh, oil price, uh, and so on and so forth. So all of this have a direct impact uh, in terms of how it should uh, look like. But I think in an ideal in an ideal situation, from a research perspective, I think a global supply chain would help because it will have uh, trickle a lot of uh, development benefit, economics development benefit, environmental development benefit, human development benefit, etc. Et for all of the stakeholders uh, involved in that global uh, system. Uh, and then also access to the global market, which is huge. So let me give you one tangible exam example, EV market, electric vehicle market. So uh, there's a, a, a growing uh, EV market uh, in Europe, uh, in Asia, and in, in the US as well, especially now when we are uh, transitioning to uh, uh, net zero uh, by 2050 we, and phasing out diesel uh, car and petrol car. So I think that uh, will tell a, a very interesting picture in terms of how that global supply chain is going to be even more important in order to ensure that that is going to happen. I think that was referring primarily to the foundation industries where there is symbiosis between um, companies and you know how how we develop that which is quite local probably to optimize it as opposed to um, you know, moving those resources around the planet, you know, the idea of moving one waste stream to be a raw material for something else, you know, 20,000 miles away or whatever, 10,000 miles away. Uh, that is the kind of um, question in my mind, is, 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 is how much do we focus on our use of local resources that are generated by uh, recycling and how much do we rely on that? Is there a danger of lock-in? To a certain type of uh, uh, waste stream as your raw material, and this is this is, this is I think this is a, a, a difficult question. Um, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, I, uh, from the <laughs> from from this perspective, yes, if we can, uh, you know, enhance the uh, adoption of circular economy, do more recycling and local sourcing, etc., that will be fantastic. If we can remove a lot of unnecessary. Uh, uh, moving materials, you know, from A to, to B across uh, the globe, that will be fantastic. Uh, but we still need to do a lot of research in order to make yeah. sure that the, uh, the efficiency, uh, scalability, etc., of the recycled material are up to the standards and functionality that are expected by the applications. Yeah. 
I think that's the point I'm making is, I, I, you know, we know we can get raw material X from this source somewhere around the planet. We can deliver it, it's going to work, but we, we need, to, we can also get that, 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 that raw material from a waste stream, let's say an e-waste stream. Um, and it's, it's about that balance between those things and how we, how we move forward. And I don't think it's so clear in my mind, but um, it's, a, it's a point of debate. Um, okay, I think we're coming to the end of the hour. So unless there is any burning questions from the participants, is there any last one question? I know I took up some time and I apologize, but I, I, I have a, a bee in my bonnet about that. Um, I don't see any more. Some thank yous coming in from uh, in the chat room, which I whole, wholeheartedly endorse. It's always a pleasure to see you, Lenny. I haven't seen you in three dimensions for most of two years. Uh, so maybe one, maybe we should get together and uh, have a chat face to face in the in the near future. Um, uh, and thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us on this webinar. There will be a new, uh, another uh, uh, Blue Skies uh, Greener Future or Green Future webinar uh, coming up. Debbie, could you post a date for that in the chat? Um, just so, because I can't, I can't remember what the date was. Uh, but there's one coming up, I believe, next month. And this is an ongoing series. And we are here to, to present as much as we possibly can be the latest, most up-to-date research in as many different arenas as we possibly can, uh, coming out of principally academia, uh, which is what we're trying to do with this. Um, okay, so thank you very much, Lenny. That was marvelous. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian, and everybody, and Debbie, for organizing this fantastic. I really enjoy it. So let's keep in touch. Any question, please just get in touch with uh, Debbie, Ian, or myself. Okay, so thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.